Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Record Club, where this week we're going to be talking about an album that's actually celebrating its 20th anniversary. It came out in 2003. We're going to be talking about the self-titled Blink-182 album. If you know us, you've actually seen us talk about a sort of sister band to this project before in the form of Angels and Airwaves, a um a very special video. But today we are joined, of course, by one of our favorite pop punk enjoyers, Connor, to discuss this album properly. We've never talked about Blink-182, and this is a very broadly pro-pop punk space so, you know, kind of wanted to get all of our ducks in a row and cover one of the the titans of the genre. So we found a very good excuse to do so. Mm. Yeah, we've talked a lot about um, pop punk on this show and it's many forms, you know, the the there's that copy pasta about you know real true emo is is not pop punk pop <laughs> punk is not emo we've talked about pop punk we've talked about emo we've talked about hardcore punk uh from the sort of nexus period of the mid to late 90s through to the mid 2000s in many different forms talked about records from jimmy world and, and say anything and we talked about more modern iterations upon that as well uh, one of the videos this year that's left the greatest impact on me personally is our video on Falling in Reverse, uh, where we talked about Fashionably Late for its 10th anniversary. And the reason I bring that up is because in that video, I made a kind of, I went to great pains to make a kind of point more broadly about the difficulties of being uh, a pop punk defender and a pop punk enjoyer in the current era when there's so much negativity and so much controversy and so much ugliness associated with that world historically. And, and just so much bad music. Yeah, that too as well. Maybe more. Um, and the existence of Ronnie Radke. Yeah, but no more. We, 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 we're no more talking about the existence of Ronnie Radke. That's enough of that. I mention all this only to say that Blink-182, indisputably one of the most famous pop punk bands of all time, uh, massively successful in the late 90s with records like Enema of the State and then Take Your Pants Off and Jacket. And then their 2003 self-titled album, their fifth record, which we're going to talk about today, which was, you know, the second highest pinnacle of their career commercially and spawned one of the most memed, uh, you know, and it feels weird to even call it a pop punk or an emo song, but we'll get to whatever I Miss You is very shortly. Uh, one of their biggest songs ever. Um, and I mention all this context only because Blink-182 are, they're an interesting band. Like when I think of them, when I think about the vast majority of their music, I think about the kind of sort of juvenile, puerile, immature, goofy and lowbrow iterations upon the sort of hardcore space in the late 90s, right? You, you had bands like Green Day who were kind of elevating it to this sort of more, you know, uh, serious space of, of, of artistic contemplation and, and the realities of drug addiction, all these kinds of things. And you had, you know, in the other corner, you had a band like Blink-182 who were doing whatever the fuck they were doing on Dude Ranch, basically. Um <laughs> You know, for a while that was their reputation. And the increasing success that Blink-182 received fueled the flames of the ambition of its core members as well. Mark Hoppus, Tom DeLonge, and Travis Barker, especially Tom DeLonge, who as the guitarist and main vocalist had kind of stepped up to take a kind who to essentially take the de facto front man position, even though, you know, for a band like this the contributions and the presence of all three core members is pretty evenly spread. Like they're all pretty much equally famous, which is a kind of rare thing, right? And a real testament to what a successful and enduring band they are. Is it's not just, you know, Tom DeLong's band. It's it's these three guys are on equal footing. And I've, you know, you could make you could I could see an argument that the most famous member is Travis Barker, who's just the drummer. So the the success and the level of uh, recognition that Blink One Ninety Two had even up to this point was was significant, and you had a lot of bands, you know, coming out of the nineties into the two thousands, attempting to kind of see basically how ambitious they could get. You know, this was an era where uh, Radiohead were the biggest, were the most critically revered band in the world, and it kind of set a template essentially for this idea that you can start out as a, a fairly juvenile, if immature band, have a massive amount of success and then become 
you know, commercial juggernauts who are also the most respected artists in music, basically. And that, I think, created an aspiration for a lot of bands who were coming from a place that was regarded more, you know, with derision and looked down upon as like, okay, we basically it's on us essentially to prove ourselves and prove that we're more than just a template and that we can rise above uh, essentially, especially when you're coming into an era where there's more and more of a saturation of bands like us as well, and more and more of a need artistically to want to distinguish yourselves. Um, but Blink-182 are, are interesting because unlike some other bands who w- through the nineties and, and 2000s were willing to kind of torpedo their commercial success in order to make these kinds of more ambitious and arty and critically savvy albums, Blink-182 never really seemed to want to forego that commercial success. They always kind of wanted to tread the line and be able to do both in this era. And so that comes through, especially in the way that that Tom DeLonge talks about the band and the way that he kind of envisions the band and in his sweeping ambitions once the band go to hiatus. And he, of course, forms Angels and Airways, which we've talked about in the past. So this album exists at a really, really interesting juncture. It's the kind of the last hurrah, essentially, of a band of musicians who's kind of inter their interpersonal relationships have kind of fallen apart as they're all pulled in different directions. And as Tom especially is more and more stepping up to kind of dictate what he wants the band to be and the kind of, and is maybe even becoming a little bit consumed by, you know, the, the thirst for celebrity and the thirst to be a kind of Bono like figure for the 21st century. Right. And all of that sort of feeding into the production of this record, which I I think compared to previous Blink-182 albums is a marked difference. There's a marked difference in sound here. There's a marked difference in approach to uh, musical songwriting, if not the lyricism, which we'll get to. What's interesting about it is that even though they've kind of displayed this increased ambition and this desire to be kind of, you know, seen more three-dimensionally they continue to work with longtime producer jerry finn who at this time as well had produced records for uh well he, he was mostly uh an engineer in the 90s he engineered records for green day and jewel breaker and produced the last two blink 182 records before this one mixed alkaline trios from here to infirmary had a really esteemed resume basically also worked as a producer and mixer on tom DeLong's initial side project with Travis Barker, Boxcar Racer, which is much forgotten now, but they put out their self-titled and only uh, record the year before this one. And the direction that album takes is very much kind of a forecast for DeLong's ambitions with with Blink uh, in this particular era as well. Uh, This is at the same time as Jerry Finn was producing AFI's Sing the Sorrow as well and uh, Alkaline Trio's Good Morning. So this was a kind of nexus point, essentially, for these bands. That all aside, the reason why I wanted us to talk about this right here and right now, Morgan originally suggested it for a record club that was sort of scheduled a little bit further down the line, but I was like, no, we need to talk about this for the 20th anniversary. We have a guest today, Connor, who we've invited you along as well, because I know you're a pretty big fan of of this record, as well as an esteemed pop punk enjoyer, as Jake said in the intro. What I want want to hear from you, what's your relationship with this particular album like? And why do you think, and what do you think about this record for Blink as well, given some of their, their reputation and some of their maybe more irreverent stuff in the past? What do you think makes this record so special and such a cut above for this band? Before listening to this album i actually wasn't really much of a blink fan um i I really only knew a lot of the singles the the ones that everyone knows damn it all the small things what's my age again uh first date like songs like that and i enjoyed those songs but the thing is this was a band that i felt like i couldn't really take seriously enough to become like a full-fledged fan and so when i heard about uh this album being like the mature album i was like okay and maybe i'll maybe i'll dig it maybe i won't um and and upon listening to it for the first time i was kind of scared like i wasn't super into it but the more i came back to it the more like every single melody and production choice and song just really stuck with me probably the only blink album that i love all the way through because it's it's hard for me again to take I mean, Enema of the State and stuff, fun records. I'll listen to them, but 
it's so silly that I have to take in small doses and the recent stuff. I, yeah, mm. not for me. Morgan, I have to imagine that you maybe have a somewhat similar relationship as well. Or do you want to speak to what this album, what you think of this album for Blink as well and why you think it kind of stands out in their catalog? Outside of I Miss You, no, pretty much none of their biggest songs are found on this album. I mean, although obviously there are plenty of candidates that made it onto the, you know, the greatest hits compilation, which is where a lot of my familiarity with this album came from in my early years of music listening it's interesting to call this the the maturation of blink 182 uh relative to the trajectory of their career because this is um not at all an emotionally mature album yeah um that's for sure and really i i I mean that in the best way mostly but also you know sort of as a it is a little bit of a dig i think for the most part and especially relative to their discography, this holds up pretty immaculately. It has moments of, uh, you know, relative adventurousness for the band. Like the Fallen Interlude kind of sounds like Travis Barker's more hip hop styled influences leaking in a little bit. But yeah, songs like "I Miss You" and "Down" and "Obvious." You know, they they've traded in the the dick jokes of the thirteen year olds for the sort of emotional maturity of 13 year olds in the sense that this is a very you know all of the feelings are turned up to 10 but you know what matters is that they believe it you know there is no lack of conviction on this album it's easy to classify this as the album where they sort of they really leaned into like the variety of influences like the cure as seen by the robert smith feature as well as, you know, later influences on DeLong that would appear, such as, you know, you, you too. But, you know, I think this is just more of a refinement of the palette that they were playing with to begin with. And, you know, it's not that significant of a departure, really, especially when you consider that something like Adam's song was on Enema of the State, even. Well, mm-hmm. so, so what's interesting about this album to me is that it's an album of dichotomies right or or dissonances even it's an album where there's a refinement and adventurousness in the musicality that is met with basically the same old shit in the lyricism there is a sense with which so much of the of what this album is is a very conscious and maybe even try hard effort to reposition the band's image in a more legitimate light and It's really interesting how, to me, obvious those attempts are and and kind of shallow even. But what what I love about the record is that it is all of those things. It's a pretty shallow and surface level attempt to make Blink-182 be seen as a serious band. I mean, the Fallen interlude makes absolutely no sense on this record, but it's here because it's a weird genre mix-up with a kind of trip-hop experiment. And same with the the, the Stockholm Syndrome interlude as well. It's just a pre- pretentious bit of spoken word that absolutely does not need to be here at all, but gives the guise of a kind of more serious album that would, oh, I, see, to me, what this record is, is um tom and travis especially like sitting down and being like okay how can we how can we what does a serious band do basically like what does a serious like mm-hmm. critically revered rock band it's, do like how do you that know? meme of all those kids sitting on the couch being like talking about like Fortnite or whatever except it's making <laughs> a pop punk album that people will take seriously yeah and um it's you know one of those that one of, yeah one of the things is oh let's put a spoken word interlude before one of the songs for no reason let's uh I'm sure Travis Barker was fully and completely responsible for whatever the fallen interlude is supposed to be uh, because he <laughs> wanted to put it on there we call a song asthenia you know we 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 get Robert Smith on the album and we it, do it it's in the- all very Smashing Pumpkins frankly yeah. in a good way mostly yeah. and and that's the thing right is that to me it's all very much posturing and it's all very obvious but they're really good at it like they're really good musicians and they do a really good job of you know not an elegant job of integrating these influences into what they're doing but they do as you say morgan they commit to it and in a weird way it's like i feel i need to confront 
that this is what they're clearly trying to do and they're doing it in a very inelegant way so that I can express how much I love this record without feeling as though like I'm falling for critical catnip basically and i'm saying oh this is the best blink 182 record because it's the record where they you know did all this and this and this and then realized you know how that it was some kind of natural evolution of where they were heading as opposed to a very clear and deliberate repositioning because the last two albums were called enema of the state and take your pants off and jacket you you this is <laughs> this is a take hard, off your pants and jacket but this is yeah uh, this is a hard lift right but it's also a hard lift being done by guys who really haven't yet, if ever, developed the capacity to sing about anything beyond how shitty it feels to not get the girl you want or to be heartbroken. One thing that I was really struck by uh, listening to this in full this week is I was expecting there to be some real heaviness on this record. And there's, way, there's one song, I think, that has a subject matter that I would say is genuinely like kind of, you know, gritty and unpleasant in a way that feels like beyond just romantic issues and that's the song go which is not even two minutes long and it's about mark hoppus as a child essentially witnessing his mother getting abused basically and it's this and it's it's so striking when you get to that, that on the yeah. album because so much of it up until that point has just been like my my heart hurts i'm sorry it's funny because that song go is like the only one that could kind of fit on the last two albums sonically <laughs> but then the lyrics are just like oh okay and so that's what i mean about like dissonances on this record it's just these these clashes and contrast throughout the album you know the most obvious point of of, of contrast that's been a defining blink 182 thing is mark and tom as a peer right tom as the you know overly emotive and really kind of like you know uh the singer who elongates you know his cadence and has this kind of really whiny voice and then mark as this kind of like much more withdrawn and broody kind of counterpoint to that i mean in that sense you know i miss you is one of the most definitive blink 182 songs because not only is it one of the most successful as well it's one of the best to showcase that particular dichotomy you know of of, uh, of, of tom singing where are you and matt and, and mark just going miss you I think the biggest band reference point that Blink are pulling from with this, I think is pretty clearly Jimmy Eat World, not only because of some of the you know more surface level similarities and how they kind of construct songs musically, but also the fact that Tom DeLonghi is an avowed Jimmy Eat World fan who hired them oh. to play at his wedding. <laughs> and specifically, this is, the, I love this anecdote. Right on, man. I love this anecdote because it's so revealing about him in both positive and negative ways. Uh, but he hired them to play at his wedding. And while they were playing the song episode four from their album Static Prevails, uh, and him and his wife were dancing, that was the first time he ever told her he loves her. <laughs> Wait, at the wedding? What? Apparently. I don't know how <laughs> true that story is, but that's the receipt. Yeah, I, I don't. Story. It's just kind of a dude that he's just like talking about out of both sides of his mouth at any given moment. So I don't know how much I buy that, but that is very funny. Well, it doesn't really matter if it's true because it's what yeah. he said, right? And and it's, so that tells us um, enough about him. So influenced enough by Jimmy Eat World to hire them to play at his wedding and to tell his wife, it's supposedly tell his wife he loves her for the first time while they're playing a song from their first proper album, which I think that album static prevails is the one album i thought of the most while listening to this there's just riffs and songs like obvious and asthenia that just make me think of that album immediately you know that album's a lot more rough around the edges and that's like a much more sort of you know lo-fi sounding record but there's a lot of shared dna in terms of how the songs are constructed between that album and this one clarity as well I think to a to a significant extent too like static prevails clarity era jimmy world but what's interesting about it is it's like um you know, Static Prevails and Clarity are these kind of more sort of hardcore tinged, like 90s tinged sort of pop punk albums from a band that hadn't yet made it big, basically. But, but we're at their most ambitious and at their most kind of creative in this period before, you know, they, they struck big with Bleed American. And it's like Blink 182 are kind of trying to do the inverse. They're trying to go from essentially being, you know, one of the biggest commercial success pop punk bands in the world to kind of regress a little bit and, and get into their more ambitious shit and see if they can kind of keep up the level of success they were having while doing that. 
So I, I feel like we should just start. We, we've danced around it enough. We should get. We should start talking about these songs, and we should start with "I Miss You" because we have to start with "I Miss You" because it's it's. We would be. It would be too much of an elephant to avoid it. An absolute juggernaut of a song. I can remember hearing this song over and over when I was six years old, and there's very little music I can say that about. But I remember, I just distinctly, I remember the music video. I remember listening to the song over and over and over again when I was six years old. This song, to a not insignificant degree, shaped my idea of what rock music is. <laughs> How fucking crazy is that? I, th- this particular brooding ballad with this sort of, you know, uh, scratchy acoustic guitar loop and these prominent cellos and this sort of explosive chorus. I mean, it's a ballad, basically. It's very unusual for the kind of tenor of Blink-182. I think even on the album, it stands out as like kind of markedly different from what they're doing most of the time. What do you guys think of this song? (laughs) It is utterly impossible to separate the years and years that this song has been in my life and the number of ways that I have felt about it in those years from my feelings on it there's two people in the world two kinds of people in the there's not two people in the world there's two kinds of people in the world there's ones that that grew up with this and sort of remember what it was like to be 14 or whatever and then there's people who hear it and remember what it was like to be 14 and want to commit toaster bath and you know it's easy to see either perspective i've been on both sides of it of just remembering how embarrassing it is to be 14 years old and you know with now i'm at the stage in my life where i can really you know there are things about it that i never really appreciated before that i do now uh like i think the song sounds incredible one repeating drum rhythm pretty much runs through the whole song that one guitar riff of the the acoustic octave slide up and down the neck and the lyrics and vocals and the and then cellos and strings and etc come in and it's really it's a full song and it's fully committed to what it's doing the fork scratching on the plate of the where are you that i can't <laughs> fully escape even now what? You know, on one hand, he didn't have to do that, and he did. He d- he he made that f- he made that decision fully. And on the other hand, why did nobody talk him out of doing? It? <laughs> to me, this is easily the hardest song on the album to properly judge, like how I feel about it because of the ubiquity of it over the years. It's kind of hard not to think about it as, in a way, the the wonder wall of pop punk. And, yeah, it's a great and, the, and just the way, yeah. yeah, this is also somewhat of a PSA to say, uh, musicians out there on social media, stop covering the song. We don't need to hear it. Just it's stop. Like the, okay? I like the Wonderwall thing as well because like Wonderwall is like the most famous song from the most famous Brit pop band, and it's not a Brit pop song. This is the most nope. famous song yeah. from one of, if not the most famous pop punk band, and it's not a pop punk song. Really, it's yeah. not at all. And the thing is, like like what Morgan was saying, this song, I think, sounds good. Like, I think it's really well produced. It's just so impossible also to separate it from, like, all of the, all of the jokes and stuff. I mean, the again, like the Tom DeLonge verse is... In, when people make fun of emo music, they point to that specific verse. Like, Ringe emo... incarnate? Yes. It's like, yeah. emo is whiny. Here's proof. Where are you? <laughs> it, it's just be, so in that regard i mean i like the song overall i think it's you know a well-written fine song but like it's just it's hard to like take seriously anymore for me just because of all i think though i think e- the even worse offender than the than delong's deliver del- <laughs> delong's <laughs> delivery <laughs> that's that's awesome um <laughs> delong's delivery service it's not delivery. It's DiGiorno, DeLongo. I don't know. There's something there. I need, I'll, I'll workshop it. Workshop um, it. I think what's even more criminal than his delivery there is the uh, we can live like Jack and Sally if we want line, yeah. which 
Oh, <laughs> which is just oh uh, god, I can't get me off of this Tumblr thread. Get me off of Dude, it right it's now. Inspired as many soon, Jack Skellington tattoos. It, it as soon as that lyric came out, like I I went like, you know the the kombucha girl meme where she tries yeah. it and she's like, mm. like that was me in reverse, <laughs> or I was kind of like, yeah. Mm. And then all of a sudden I heard the Jack and Sally lyric and I was like, like oh, okay, all right, I'm off this train. Mm. Uh, it, it makes you think of like, if it doesn't make you think of a very specific kind of person that you knew in high school, you didn't pay very close attention because this person was everywhere. And I knew eight people just like them and was probably friends with a ton of them. Um, to build off of what you two are saying, I... I have the lamentable task of trying to articulate my opinion on things like this song, this album, and this band without coming across like a giant fucking douchebag. Uh, because, you know, you're all obviously very nostalgic for this, and a lot of it has, you know, been reappraised in the coming years. Like, this album in particular is one that I see a lot of people are very fond of. And while listening to it last night, I had this overriding thought, uh, which was... A bit more existential than I planned on getting with the self-titled Blink-182 album. And halfway through, after I had long passed this song, I asked myself a question. And that was, do I actually like pop punk? <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, is that I, I everybody I feel like has a genre or a subgenre of music that just has an unusually high barrier for entry for them specifically. Like, I don't know if, if something immediate comes to mind or if you like had to measure your, what your ratings were and what you they correlated with your personal feelings. I'm sure that there are statistically for each person different variants of this phenomenon happening. And for the longest time, we thought on this show that my allergy to music was with house music. So now I'm going to substitute that in place and say that I am very, very, very picky about my pop punk to the point where trying to articulate why I like some albums and bands and not other albums and bands becomes a very difficult exercise, much like when we reviewed Say Anything last year. And I was just like, there is a lot to appreciate about this shit here and, and a lot of stuff that I really like and a lot of stuff that I really enjoy. And there is an equal amount of stuff that if it's not geared directly against me it's just something that really rubs me the wrong way and there's more often than not more of it that i can feasibly tolerate and the sad fact of the matter is i'm probably not saying that anything that anybody hasn't heard about this band or this album before because like i have all of the expected takes here and that like christ alive i really just hate listening to talk to long sing <laughs> let morgan reference the fork on the plate thing and i really couldn't think it's like either that or nails on like a metal signpost outside i just like this isn't even like a like uh, my thing with like bono of u2 where i hear his voice and instantly i'm like comatose or or whatever it's like no 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 it's just the whiny, nasally affectation that he is insistent on employing here very very aggressively especially on songs like i miss you and it is just it especially on this song it just really undercuts the emotion that it's going for like we're already kind of on a shaky foundation lyrically because he's referencing all these things other than the jack and sally shit <laughs> this album has lots of moments where tom will lyrically pontificate on ideas like the darkness and shadows and all of this stuff that's very very vague and it's like the worst when i look the worst it, lyric on I, this album the worst lyric on this album and it's in a song i love but the absolute worst lyric on this album by far is like violence you kill me um, <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> that is exactly what i'm talking about like because i really don't feel like those things are in a vacuum and i really hate coming at this from the perspective of Blink-182 are not lyrically sophisticated enough for me. <laughs> That's the thing, is that with pop punk like this, there has to, for me anyway, there has to be an edge somewhere. Like this is, like, I kind of feel like we're in the reverse state of when we talked about Alkaline Trio this year, which is way more my thing than things like Blink-182 are. Um, but like with that, there's like an angstier, gothier kind of like, 
gin soaked sort of apathy that's on that album that I find very compelling as a way to dress up all these topics. Um, or, you know, you have more modern bands like Pup, for instance, which I think really sort of like they lean into the the snotty brattiness of their lyricism, but also they they're they're dark and confrontational in a way that a lot of bands like them aren't. And then you have here, and I just don't really have an in on anything. Like lyrically, mm. this is the kind of stuff that probably would appeal to me more when I was a kid and appeals to my sense of nostalgia. There are moments where I do think that this album actually veers into being a little bit more, you know, ambitious and complicated. And that's probably when I like it the most. Uh, but at the same time, I'm just, I need more details in my songwriting. Like, you know, the pop punk I was weaned on was like the Menzingers. And I know that that's probably an unfair standard to hold all of these other things to, but it's like, I get these amazing combinations or bands like Jimmy Eat World, for instance, which I'm way more familiar with, bands that really blend how sophisticated their musicianship is with how compelling that their writing is. And because I got into those bands first, when I go back to the progenitor here, it feels a little bit flavorless. It feels a little bit bland. That said, I want to say that there are things about this album that are genuinely quite excellent from the outside looking in as someone who doesn't have the nostalgia that you three do. I think the most obviously excellent thing about basically the whole album is just Travis fucking Barker. He's demolishing the kit across this record. Like, it is truly truly something to behold in the, the the landscape of musicians like this and in probably you know the, these bands are like woefully underappreciated for how great musicians they typically are i think again jimmy world is a great example of a band who clearly know their shit musically and blend that into the fact that they're great at song construction and blink 182 are great at song construction as well there's not anything on here that really feels like except for the stupid like interlude tracks but on here feels like it meanders it doesn't really like feel like they're you know pussyfooting around or their attempts to mature sonically are like really holding them back at all it makes them more interesting but at the same time i'm used to full-throated commitment i'm used to these aesthetics being leaned for in like a way stronger and bolder way so when i see this band who are, again, they're a little bit more on the flavorless side for me. And when they gesture at ideas greater than themselves, it's like, cool, I like that you're doing this, but I don't necessarily think you're succeeding. And that's kind of a problem for me. That's the overriding feeling that I got while listening to this album is that it was just like, there's a lot to appreciate here, especially if you're a Blink fan. I'm not, though. Okay, so I'm going to explain, I think, why this album really works for me in a way that won't contradict or won't like in in some way feel as though it kind of stands in any way against what you just said jake but also kind of i think explains why this record in particular is the best one and it starts with i miss you which we we, we live with before and now the, the thing the thing about the song that we haven't really remarked on yet is that really it's 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 lyrically and vocally it is equally equal parts mark and tom okay maybe it's a little bit more tom but it starts with mark right mm -hmm. and it's and mark has this just <laughs> very i don't know so mark has this muted delivery hello there the angel from my nightmare and and to be honest he's not very good at it <laughs> not, not really like, no like like tom delong is not a very good singer and, the, and and Mark Hoppus is not a very good singer, but they're both effective. And why I think the song works, and it's a microcosm for what I love about this album, and why I think this album works, because it's not just Tom DeLong, it's not just Travis Barker, it's not just Mark Hoppus. It is the three of them. And they balance each other out in really critical ways that if any of them were missing, it just wouldn't work. The thing about I Miss You that makes it a great song to me, and I, I think it is a legitimately a perfect song, is that that muted delivery of Mark and that ridiculously over-the-top delivery of Tom. I mean, you have to imagine, it's hard for us, but what I one of the things I tried to do very consciously uh, to prep for this was to try and imagine what it would be like to hear I Miss You for the first time, not knowing who this band was, not having her imagine, not knowing any of the other songs, just imagining what it would be like to hear this song, to kind of get through this song 
for the first minute of it, hearing this very emotionally muted delivery from Mark Hoppus and just sort of kind of being in this really moody space with these very kind of, you know, tastefully brushed drums and this acoustic guitar and all that sort of stuff. And then hearing Tom <laughs> DeLong's part for the first time, just like a bullet through glass, just completely shattering it. But it's the thing that makes it work because Mark himself is not enough to make this a great song. And I don't think Tom himself would be enough to make this a great song. It's a great song because it's both of those parts of being heartbroken and being depressed and missing someone, right? It's that part of you that is, you know, internally struggling, trying to kind of overcome and trying to kind of move forward and kind of trying to kind of put on a brave face. You know, that's Mark's part, basically. It's the part that's trying to stay collected, the part that's trying to essentially, you know, keep you together so that you survive this. And then Tom is the other part of you, the part of you that wants to just basically have a fucking breakdown, the part of you that wants to scream and cry, and the part of you that wants to just bemoan how unfair it all is. And Mark and Tom together, they're, they're these two sides of, of, of you know of teenage angsty heartbreak and and in and, and, and all of those things right they're those two sides that are always in conflict right and it's something that continues when you into adulthood as well you just get better at managing it but there's always that part of you that's like mark that part of you that's meek that's part of you that knows you know it's kind of like a like an id super ego thing if you want to get freudian with it right there's that part of you that <laughs> You know, Mark is like the super ego is that part of you that knows, you know, what's appropriate and, and knows what's healthy and knows what you should do and how you should kind of process this. But there's the it as well. There's that part of you that, you know, you're constantly fighting against, basically. And that dynamic, that tension and the way that it's shown so dramatically with this song and how different these performances are, that's the special thing that makes it all gel together and work for me. Because when I listen to I Miss You and I hear these two performers back to back, I it, 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 together it's this total and complete you know, realization of all of the angsty, shitty, you know, self-righteous pain and indignation that I've ever felt. And that internal battle that goes on basically every time you go through it. And so to me, this, I think, is one of the greatest, whether you want to call it a breakup song, whether you want to call it a heart, heartbreak song, whether you just want to call it a song about being fucking, you know, feeling as though you've been really fucking wronged or feeling really fucking sad, right? I think it's one of the greatest songs ever in that realm because it's just does such a beautiful job of displaying, you know, the the ways in which you process that and the the, the internal battle basically that you're fighting uh you know to survive and to kind of get through that emotionally intact um so yeah i i think that is the, the absolute pinnacle of the album and that's a microcosm for why blink work and then so you ask okay so there's mark is that super ego or whatever mark is that kind of more you know measured sort of intelligent mature um you know personage and then tom is that kind of more unfiltered thing what is travis well travis is the the connective tissue right travis is the ego itself travis is the thing that ties it all together that that moderates everything that makes it all feel as though it's part of the same tissue and and he does that by fucking unleashing these ridiculous fills like every song basically every song has not just great drumming but memorable drumming drum lines you can go away mm -hmm. from this album and remember you know be, be fucking smacking your desk or whatever you know getting that stuck in your head right that's one of the things that you know is a trade is a trademark of any great drummer right yeah you're a great drummer you're you're a you know, you're a drummer if you can, if you know how to serve the song, if you know how to kind of basically give it that rhythmic backbone, but you're an elite drummer if you, if your contributions themselves can be kind of isolated and, and marveled at, even outside of that context. And Travis just continually delivers that. And it's the glue that holds the whole album together. And it's the kind of thing as well that makes you kind of inclined to allow the indulgence of it. Uh, while I'm not a particular fan of the Fallen interlude, I do have to like marvel at like how he's... That, that little drum solo he has at the end of I'm Lost Without You at the very end of the album. It's like, how, that's so unnecessary, but he just does that shit so that he can be the one to have the last word. And I love I'm, that. I'm glad he did it. The ending of I'm Lost Without You. I'm When you brought up the whole Jimmy World comparison, it actually, it really reminded me of the ending of Lucky Denver Mint, which ends in a similar way with yeah. these two drum tracks going at each other, almost, almost off time, but kind of like, forming together to be in time it, yeah. it's a cool moment 
Yeah, yeah. And again, I really think that Jimmy Eat World like hugely influential on the approach to this album as well. Some really creative, um, not just drumming on on their their early records, but like like you say, like the way that the drums are produced and the way that the drums are manipulated. And you know, and there's lots of that on this record as well. I mean, it's not all Travis, it's drum machines on this album too. It's a loaded with, you know, all sorts of different like in the studio with a huge budget throwing shit into this record because they can afford to. Um, okay, so the dichotomy of, of Mark and Thomas for me, what makes a blink blink 182 great. But there's also moments where if you are a little allergic to Tom, and look, there's records, there's songs on this record that are real like Tom heavy. Uh, songs like feeling this songs like violence uh songs like uh asthenia and always uh great songs i think but if those songs are too much for you there are songs that are much more mark driven i mean one of the biggest and best songs on this record is stockholm syndrome and that's mark lead and yes. he's like giving a really great vocal performance on that even within his limited range as well I think that Here's Your Letter is an underrated song as well. Like really great sort of buried in the back half deep cut with a great vocal from Mark. Really enjoy that track. The one, two of Easy Target and all of this, which like the way that um, the basically instrumental backdrop and a musical foundation of Easy Target is then reincorporated into all of, all of this is really, really cool, I think. And I love the way that this, the two songs are linked like that. I, I think that the sound, and, and I mean, all of this is like the best example of, a, along with I Miss You, I think is a song you can point to and be like, okay, here's the most obvious example of how Blink-182 are trying to kind of reframe their image and trying to kind of shift their perception to be kind of seen as a more three-dimensional band. And I think it's a great song. I mean, what do you guys think of this, of the Robert Smith feature in particular? And because to me, whenever I listen to this album, even though I know it's coming, it's always jarring to hear Robert Smith start <laughs> singing. But what do you guys think of the song and this feature? I mean, it's bizarre, but it really works. I, I wasn't expecting to think that because I saw the like featuring Robert Smith thing and was like, as somebody who doesn't have any familiarity with this whatsoever, what? But, you know, they kind of managed to make it feel like it works. And I also just like Robert Smith's style of writing and like, you know, The Cure. Let's be real. There's not like that much of a difference between the kind of teenage angst that both of these artists kind of pull from. Um, obviously, Robert Smith delivers it in a more, you know, prosaic, kind of gothic, emotionally affected, melodramatic kind of way. He dresses up all of these things. And th there's a kinship that the two of them have that I do feel like is harnessed here in a way that feels really unique and interesting that I, I for like, for better or worse, I think is one of the better moments on this record that works for me the most and kind of internally made me be like you know why does stuff like the cures music speak to me so much but blink 182 just kind of doesn't and it's that sense of theatricality that i feel like one has that the other doesn't they're able to easily synthesize themselves but that's sort of the key is that it, it, morgan kind of said it earlier is that like these there are moments where songs like these when they get really melodramatic you know puts you right back in the state of mind of like being younger to the point where you would have maybe more strongly related to stuff like this. And I won't lie, that's that's a part of it because I, I listen to a lot of the lyricism on here and I'm like, oh God, I feel like a stupid fucking 15 year old. I don't like this, get it away. I want it to be over now. But yeah. sorry, more often than not, musically, I do still find it compelling enough. And like to the point where I feel like this rather ambitious moment is maybe the my favorite thing I've heard from Blink-182, barring maybe What's My Age Again, because I, I think that's a great single. But this is probably my favorite Blink song, honest to God. And again, it's so unblink in like so many ways. It's so moody. It's so downcast. Mm -hmm. It goes for like almost five minutes. It's really like you're lingering in that. And then the, the use me go on and use me it's like so tasteful and tuneful and like you know beautiful almost it's a really arresting song i think it was particularly good decision on blink's part to basically let this be a robert smith song mm. because yeah <clears throat> again like tom like only did, like this part you just sang the hook like 
that's the only thing he does vocally in this song and robert just carries the rest it would have been i think it would have been kind of disastrous if they went for like an i miss you duet style yeah um but yeah i think i think (laughs) i think the song is the most probably the most beautiful song that blink has ever made period yeah and i i find it interesting as well this was um around the same time that robert smith and the rest of the cure were teaming up with ross robinson to record their self-titled album as well right so there must have been a little bit of a sense of, of of hardcore in the air, which is just funny because the song is so moody and so kind of downcast and, and brooding. Um, Morgan, what do you think of, of the Robert Smith feature on this Blink-182 album? I love this song. It's It was interesting to think about how, like I got into this band through a lot of their singles um, around the same time that I was getting into Green Day and other bands of that ilk and at that age so and again i only had the greatest hits album so really i got into the entirety of this album uh, a good amount of time after i had gotten into the cure so he- uh, hearing this song for the first time fully knowing who robert smith was when that it's entirely possible that that wouldn't have been the case and that this could have been what pointed me towards the cure is always uh, really interesting to think about I also got to say, I have yet so far to hear a Robert Smith feature on a song that misses, like whether it's churches or crystal castles, Yeah, like, yeah, you know what he's going to sound like and he's going to kill it. Yeah. His cover of uh, there's a girl in the corner by the twilight sad. Yeah. Ah! He still brings them on every tour he does because because he's a real one. Um, I couldn't really. I don't really have a, a neat way of um, leading this in, but I just want to throw in here that "Obvious" is a fucking amazing fucking song. I love the yeah. riffs in this song. The energy this this fucking thing brings, uh, deeply underrated from all I can gather. I don't know why this wasn't a single, especially given that it's in the single position. Um, I think it's uh one of my fa- absolute favorite Blink One Eight Two songs. Similar feelings about Stockholm Syndrome as well, which I've already mentioned, but. You know, for as much as we've been, or, you know, as much as I've bemoaned the, you know, immaturity and the emotional tone of this album, which is, again, part of the point, that's not a failure. I want to make that clear. That's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, Stockholm Syndrome is, I think, uh, you know, more emotionally intelligent, maybe, than some of the other songs in this record, or just like at least more devastating to me in a way that feels sort of less petty, in a way that feels kind of more like aggrieved. Um, and and just in a way that I guess I can personally relate to a little bit more like because it's a song about like struggling with how to kind of move forward and heal and kind of healthily move on from a heartbreak um, but wanting to kind of you know put your best foot forward again that that role that Mark occupies of being that Mark more kind of grounded counterpoint uh, really like in in the songs where he leads that really kind of I really emotionally resonate with that uh, a lot more um, I already mentioned Go as well. Just a, a a weirdly just fucking devastating song lyrically, even though it's such a throwaway. I, I want to mention Always as well, because it was one of the other big singles that I remember from being a kid. And it's the only one of the three big singles that I don't like love fully. And it's a really simple thing because I think like it's a really catchy song. Uh, it sounds awesome. Like it's really memorable. It's really fun to listen to. But the one thing that just kind of sours it a little bit for me is just Tom takes it too far. Like I'm <laughs> like, um, you know, it's like a Drake meme or whatever, or whatever kind of meme where it's like, uh, let me hold you. I'm like, yeah. Touch you. I'm like, okay. Feel you. I'm like, mm. kiss you. I'm like, eh. taste you. I'm like, oh. yeah, no, nope. no. Nope. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Getting real Radiohead playing with myself vibes with this song. Nope. Abort, like, abort. Hold, hold, hold you, touch you, feel you. Great, good. Kiss you, taste you. Like, what are we? We're, we're, this is fucking, I'm starting, I'm going to start singing Eraser by Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> <laughs> as, much as, I, as much as I enjoy that song, I do think that. I just don't like, want to either hear have, yeah. Tom DeLonge talking about wanting to taste someone in any way. No. No, yeah, and but I don't think I, he necessarily look, had to do the the you refrain. Like he, I I feel like you could have changed up the lyrics. He didn't uh, like uh, verb you, verb you, verb you, verb like like an animal. There could have been a little something, <laughs> something else. 
also um, he's just such a he's such one. a head or miss lyricist for me like i'll miss your laugh uh-huh. or smile i'll admit i'm wrong if you tell me i'm so sick of fights i hate them like that line t- to me is like i'm so sick of fights i hate them <laughs> and the way he sings it that's so representative to me of of who tom DeLonge is as a writer like that's such a fucking meaningless lyric like i hate them that's implied bro you already made that clear <laughs> it's like that thought interrupted the lyric and he wrote the lyric in real time as he was having the thought yeah and you know i can understand as well some people might get off on the wrong foot with Tom on feeling this talking about, I want to let me go in her room. I want to take off her clothes. Like it's just a weird way to present this desire. Despite the preoccupations of a lot of their music, Tom DeLonge in my head can only purely be an asexual being. If there's any deviation from this whatsoever, I'm massively uncomfortable. It's so the, fucking the funny to me. It's so the fucking stands funny for to me. alien. It's so fucking funny to me when he's like, turn all the lights down now. I'm smiling from ear to ear. (laughs) (laughs) No! It makes me hate that I love that song so much. It's a rave here, bro. It's fine. It's fucking so it goes. Look, look, to to propose a counterpoint, I think Always is probably my favorite song on here uh, because it's wholly indicative and it's one of maybe my five favorite blink songs in general because it's wholly indicative of the band like uh-huh. that's one of the songs that i would show someone yeah if they're like oh what's blink 182 like like mm-hmm. deeply embarrassing oh. uh the drums are fucking incredible and yep. it's like a perfect package of a song mm-hmm. of just like this is <laughs> this is maybe gross and i'm still i'm still deeply entertained yeah and that's the thing with blink is you have to be able to get on board with that grossness if you're ever gonna cross the threshold um but i think that the issue and just to kind of recap and kind of put a bow on it the the issue with the other blink albums i have is that the grossness for lack of a better word or just the 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 mawkish over the top whininess it's just out of balance with the more sort of restrained and tasteful and kind of really sort of, you know, uh, balancing elements, you know what I mean? On their other records. Like it's too much, there's too much Tom or too much Tom energy in most of their music. And as someone who's been very like defensive of this album, I don't think it's perfect. I do think it's a great record, but I do also think that there are, are things that could be improved about it without detracting from all those things that I said, make it what it is. But the hit rate is just phenomenal, uh, given the tenuousness of that balance. And yeah, and I just, I, I have had a lot of, a big fucking blast revisiting it this week. And thinking about the fact that I am 26 now and can remember hearing this when I was six years old and had no frame of reference for any of what this was, but immediately and immensely connected to it. And again, I probably couldn't have told you why. I was fucking six, but there was just something I I understood. And maybe it was the Tomness. Maybe it was the Tomness that I gravitated towards then. And maybe it's the Mark. The Mr. Tomness. I, and maybe <laughs> I it's was the, fucking gonna say it and then didn't. <laughs> maybe it was the Tomness of it that I graduate that I um gravitated towards then as a little kid. And maybe it's the Markness that I gravitate towards now. And maybe Travis is just the shit that's cool no matter how old you are. But yeah, it's it's a fucking it's a W out of 10. A testament to this album's quality is that I have literally any affinity for it whatsoever. I have no nostalgic connection to it. And I have been overridingly quite negative, but that's just because I'm kind of the the odd man out here. This album works way more than it doesn't. And frankly, it's just, I feel like this is the most honest litmus test for how any given person is going to feel about this band overall. It's kind of like, Uh, sort of what Morgan said with like that one song but like it's kind of an album like I I sort of feel like Anima of the State even though that's like their iconic record isn't it doesn't showcase all of the facets of the band it's a little bit more of a single-minded release from them and so this kind of evens the scale out and sort of gives you everything that they're capable of and more importantly everything that they are overridingly good at 
So it's definitely worth going to like going back to, you know, take a listen to it just because it's kind of destined to be underrated placed in their discography where it is sort of awkwardly. There's a lot of moments on this album that in theory and like when I listen to it, at least for the first time, like shouldn't work. Like, for example, the song like a song like Violence, those the verses are are just really off putting and nothing like anything that this band or really any pop punk, pop punk style band makes and it's kind of corny but when that chorus comes in it makes it all worth it mm-hmm. i think stockholm syndrome is like when i want to show someone why i think this album's great i think stockholm syndrome is like the pinnacle great pick uh because every production choice guitar layers the bass tone um the way that mark almost screams which he barely ever does, like in the bridge, is just such a killer song. I think to, for me, uh, just real quick, the the dark horse of this album for me would be Asthenia. I think that's a phenomenal song. The whole like space theme, which I know is kind of on the nose in the beginning of the song because it starts with these you know space synths and yeah. um, like NASA samples, but the whole the whole idea of like an, an astronaut being in space and not sure if it's even worth going back. That was like the one moment when I was listening to this album in high school lyrically that I like connected with the most. And a song like Down, the, down use, repeating the word down in a song is such a cliche, even up at, even at this point. Um, but the way they do it here, just with the, you know, Mark's layers and the production it just it just makes it work for me so much of this stuff should not work for me but it really does in one of the, in the best way that it probably could my dad had the cd single of down um when i was a kid and so like i that that was the one i think i probably i don't know whether i heard that or i miss you more i mean i miss you was just playing everywhere but i have distinct memories of like you know it says something when you're a kid and you have to like choose to to listen to something by, you know, taking finding getting the CD and putting it in the CD player or asking, you know, your parents to put it on. You know, that shows some level of like of, of investment that you don't necessarily need to display now to listen to something when you can just, you know, easily get it on your phone. Um, so there's something about the memory of like growing up with CD singles that my dad would buy. Like I would say, I really like this song and he would go and buy it on a, a CD single. Like Blink 182 are a quintessential CD band. Yeah. There's something so special about how you could do, how that was a thing that people did in the past, not even just go out and buy the album, but go out and buy the song on a CD. <laughs> like you had to really love the song to do that. Um, There's so much free space on that disc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah they compensated like by making compensated by making the jewel case like half as thick but it was always just really flimsy and but you got you at least you got a book like a not booklet you got like a fold out thing that you could like you know you got art so that's cool. Do something with it was just occurring to me like thinking about it um you know we've kind of approached this as like okay this is the mature blank album or the one where they kind of make the most sort of attempts to kind of posture towards maturity but maybe stealthily Take Off Your Pants and Jacket is secretly the most mature Blink-182 album. And I say that only because it's the album with Stay Together for the Kids on it, which is an amazing song that has so much like emotional just brutality to it that maybe outclasses almost anything on this album. So I don't know. I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot here a little bit. Well, shooting my thesis in the foot a little bit. But, um, you know, Anima of the State had an Adam song. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a little uh, balanced out. Uh, with the bonus track, uh, I want to fuck a dog in the ass. There we go. Yeah, so exactly. That's what we need. Yeah. Let us know what you think of this particular record and of Blink One Eighty Two in general in the comments below. Do you? Who do you agree with? What's your take on the album? Are you nostalgic for it in the same way as some of us are? Let us know your thoughts down below. If you want to go above and beyond and support us directly for just one dollar a month, you can hit the join button right there and become a member of the Jams and Tea family. Get your name on the title crawl of every video on this channel. Plus, if you recommend us some music to talk about in one of our now episodes, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Until next time, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Taco Bell.
think outside the bun.